Welcome back to The Forecast, brought to you by Headstorm, the show that teaches you how to engineer growth by learning from industry luminaries to provide you with tactical steps you can use tomorrow. Hi, I'm Julian Placino, host of Headstorm Forecast. In today's forecast, we are joined by John Cannell. John is the Chief Development Officer at Northwestern Mutual. Today, he's talking about his process for developing people into leaders. John, it's an honor. Let's get started. So tell me about your journey on how you became the chief development officer at Northwestern Mutual. So, you know, and I think it's important to understand the lay of the company and sure. how, how it works. So Northwestern Mutual is set up with a corporate office in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Okay. Uh, and then they have field offices all around the country. Sure. Each one of those field offices uh, is run by a managing partner. Okay. And so I represent the Dallas Fort Worth firm, North Texas, uh, and the managing partner, our managing partner, his name is Tate Cruz. Uh, and my role within that firm is chief development officer. And okay. so my, my role really is built into a few different functions of the business. We have 260 advisors, mm -hmm. over 700 employees in North Texas. Okay. And my role is helping develop and create a streamlined selection process mm -hmm. of all recruiting and development systems, uh, developing young advisors, so building systems, processes, helping our advisors uh, be, become career advisors. Uh, the third thing is through our training program, training new people, new advisors, uh, and, and building them up so that they have the knowledge and skill to be able to go to market. Uh, and, and then fourth is our leadership development program, uh, helping our young aspiring people in, in, in our firm uh, become the leaders they desire to be. There's many different career paths a uh, new person can take. Mm -hmm. And so my role is really to help them kind of find that career path and help them develop into the leader they want to be. Okay, great. And there was a lot of aspects that you covered yeah. there, right? Yeah. So it's uh, a variety, if you will, probably very dynamic role. Yeah. Um, and it goes from recruiting, mm -hmm. is I think what I heard, mm -hmm. all the way to leadership development. Mm -hmm. And so walk me through that journey of a financial advisor somebody coming in how do you source them what's the best way to assess skills to become a good advisor and then grow within the organization yeah yeah no that's a good question i, I think a lot of it, it for, for us it's meeting people where they're at okay um the the development process mm -hmm. the development of people starts in the selection process okay um, I, I'm a I'm a firm believer that this is the greatest career in the world for the right person. <laughs> right. Uh, but we'll in, I'll get just for perspective. We'll interview. We have nine recruiters in North Texas. Okay. Uh, and we will interview over forty five hundred people this year. Wow, that's a lot of people. And we'll turn on somewhere between sixty and eighty contracts. Okay. And so you know, for perspective, our selection process is the beginning of the people development process. This is the greatest career in the world for the right person, but it's our job to select them. Okay. And so we have many tools and resources that help us in the selection process, but I think one of the biggest mistakes that companies make in general in today's world is they try to fit square pegs into round holes. I couldn't I couldn't agree more. And yeah. and trying to find that that round peg for that round hole is so challenging, right? So at Headstorm, we have an expectations framework that we have. And we have roles from consultant, senior consultant, uh, architect, you know, primary architect, director. And we go through similar things of, around testing competency around what they are going to go do. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's interesting that you say that the LIMRA and we do coder pads for developers to go okay. see how successful they are going to be, but it's not, it's not based on behavior. Right. And I think the LIMRA does behavior if I, if that's, cor if I'm correct. Uh, yeah, it looks, it looks more at the, the market they're in okay. and, and the likelihood of success given where they're coming from. 
Um, is, there's there's no one career background that you have to have in order to become successful in what we do. Okay. Uh, most of the people in our firm were successful before they got here. Okay, that's fair. They're, they're, they're wired to be successful. Sure. What High performers. They're high a, performers. A-type personalities. Absolutely. We've got former Navy SEALs. We have former doctors, former attorneys, yeah. former engineers, former teachers, former college athletes. They were all successful before they got to us. We're not naive enough uh, from our leadership team. We're not naive enough to think that they're successful because of us. Okay. They're successful because they're wired to be successful. What we want to understand is what's going to take them to the next level. They're, they're looking for a reason. If someone comes to you looking for a job, they're looking for a reason. Mm -hmm. And it's your job to assess that and figure out what, what's their reason. Are they running from something okay. or are they running to something? And I think that's a lot of mistakes that hiring managers in today's world make is uh, they, they, they look specifically at their own needs mm -hmm. of what the company needs and here's what not our need is. The, and not looking at the person and what they're gonna be fulfilled exactly. with. Exactly, yeah. Interesting, interesting. So, um, tell me, tell me this, H how did you develop your passion around people management and growth? Well, I think I, <laughs> I screwed up a lot and I pivoted a little bit. Like, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> I, I, I honestly, I just, I screwed up a lot as a person. Mm -hmm. Like the, the 23 year old version of me, I wish I could go back and slap them in oh, the face. Oh boy. Don't you know it? <laughs> um, I, it just, you know, I, I, I look at my own journey. Uh, through my own shortcomings. Uh, and, and what I realized over time, mm -hmm. I, and something that I've developed a passion for is uh, helping people grow in their character mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and how they interact with people on a daily basis and helping them live out their mission. So my, mm -hmm. my mission in life, how did I develop my mission? Well, I mean, quite frankly, I developed my mission back in 2015 when I was fired from a software company. I was, I was working for a company that uh, was a good company. It got bought out by a private equity firm, merged with another company out on the East Coast. I was in the Midwest at the time. And through that experience, I've never felt more like a number on a page. Okay. Uh, and looking back on, that, back on that experience, I think I had to go through an experience like that. Sure to really start to develop a passion for helping people find the perfect fit. And so out of that experience, my mission was born. And, and if you've been around me at all for any amount of time, you know that and I have. Mi mission driven work yes. uh, is, is what we do. And my mission in life is to build a culture in which people thrive by using their God given gifts and talents. That's great. And so I, I live that out every day and I help people find their mission. And, and if they can find their mission, what they do is important, but why they do it is going to be even more important. So it's interesting. So uh, we talk in Headstorm about culture a lot, and I have this hypothesis or thought process that culture is two things. Culture is the place in which you work um, and the activities that happen, whether that be happy hours or game nights or anything, activities around that. But really, I think in my mind, culture is driven behind the, 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 what is the company doing for that individual to grow in your role to your point? Yeah. And I'm, I'm interested to understand your perspective on that because I think the personal growth is the engagement and the activities that happen within the organization, it just yeah. accentuates the culture, if we say it's culture. Does that yeah. make sense? No, it does. And here's a convicting thought. Someone once told me that your culture is a sum of all the things that people say mm -hmm that work there mm -hmm. when their leaders aren't in the room. Yes. Your culture is a sum of all the things That's provocative. that the people yeah. the, that aren't leading the company of all the things that your employees say when the leaders are in the room. That's that's the sum of your culture. Yes. Um, and I, I, I think that thought in and of itself should should provoke every leader it should. should should give every leader pause. a pause for questioning and figuring out, hey, what where am I at? Mm -hmm. am, am I focused on my goals, mm -hmm. my dreams, my aspirations? Am I focused on bottom line? Am I focused? Am I focused mm -hmm. on all of those things that I think are easy to get drunk off in today's world? Mm -hmm. um, or am I focused on helping people become number one, the best version of them? And number two, helping them fulfill whatever dream they want to fulfill in life.
Great. Can they do that right here? Mm -hmm. Given the experience that they're gaining right now, mm -hmm. whether that's a brand new software engineer that, you know, may or may not be with you for the next 30, 35 years. Sure. Are they having a world-class experience sitting right where they sit? I think that's important. It's I huge. Think it's important to analyze if no matter what. I've got people on my team that I know aren't going to be with me the next 30 years, but I want them to look back on this time and think, you know what? Those were good years. It's a chapter in your life that you learned a lot, right? Yeah. And and you're, you're proud as the company that you work for to send them off into the world and do and go achieve the things that they want to do, knowing that you've prepared them at a specific point in time to get the skill sets. Yeah. So to sum it up, it's all about perfecting the general flow of things, cutting out the fat and making your whole process better. From recruitment to systems building, to training and leadership programs. More efficient, more aerodynamic, more streamlined, right? But to build tomorrow's leaders, you need them to be flexible and meet them where they are, and then build them up from there by using a program that adapts to them, to where they are, to what they actually require to grow. John, you really gave us food for thought here and got really personal about your journey. Thanks for that. In our next segment, we're going to talk a bit about highly effective communication, why soft skills matter, the topic of feedback, and how to build character, so stay tuned. So talking about skill sets a little bit, um, there's a big difference between hard skills and soft skills. Yeah. Uh, um, hard skills in our world are hands-on keyboards, development, knowing code, knowing the different languages, um, you know, different strategies on how to attack products. But I think it, from a consulting perspective, it is the soft skills that really um, show through when you're working with clients. Yeah. And I would imagine that's similar to you, and I mean, the hard skills would be different, but the soft skills with financial advisors working face-to-face -face with people, having to have those communications, having to have those tough conversations at some point, or guiding conversations, how, how do you manage the two skill sets and or is there a management of the two skill sets uh are you familiar with with covey's book the seven habits of I, highly successful people i am uh one of the seven habits is practicing empathic communication um and, and i'll get into like the hard skill soft skill here in a second but when you look at the whole principle of empathic communication there, there's a there's a line in the book that says uh, uh, until you're moved by my uniqueness, mm -hmm. I'm not going to be moved by your advice. And so the whole core of that, the whole center of that is relationship. Uh, and, and everything everything foundationally that we do in our firm is built on the principle of strong relationships. Um, skills are a given. You need, you need skills. You, right. in, in, in my line of work, you need to have a lot of different licenses and designations in order to have the respect of the general public that you're working with. That's a given. Mm -hmm. um, the soft skills, some people come in with them. Some people come in without them. It's so hard to develop that soft skill. And well, it is sorry to interrupt. No, it is because what have we been taught since we were, since yeah. we were little? Everything right. that we've been taught, reading, writing, arithmetic, every single class we, we went through in elementary school, middle school, high school, college, and so on. Yeah. We've been taught competencies. Mm -hmm. We've been taught how to go out and gain knowledge to get a good job and do all these things. Mm -hmm. But very little time in those years was spent on character mm. and giving real hard feedback. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you're seeing with this generation right now coming out of college. They get punched in the mouth because the real world hit them mm -hmm. and it sets them back. And it, and it throws, throws a lot of people, even people my age, even people older, it, it it's hard to receive real feedback. And I think the reason why is because in, in, in our feedback driven world, mm -hmm. there's no relationship. Mm. And so I live by the principle of accountability mm -hmm. without relationship feels like harassment. Mm. So, so in order for, in order for me to have the difficult conversation with someone, either about a character flaw or a communication mm -hmm. issue that they have in order for me to have the real conversation, We've got to have a relationship first. That's that's super important. And they need to know that I care. They need to know that my team cares. They need mm -hmm. to know that our leaders care enough about them where this is coming from a place of love mm -hmm. and not from a place of do this because you need to do this. Yeah, that's awesome. Fantastic. 
Um, so on that topic of feedback, um, when you go through uh, a financial advisor, it goes through their their life cycle, their process of developing and you're, you're giving this feedback. <clears throat> Is there a point, and I know it's, it's probably, it's more a, an art than a science, but can you tell when somebody goes from an individual contributor to a leader and how do you assess that? And once that assessment happens, do you treat the, that person a little bit differently? Because you talk about feedback, it should be feedback yeah. constantly. Yeah, I think this varies uh, across industry. Like okay. Different different industries are, are, are gonna experience at what point is someone a leader mm. uh, th than others? In, in our industry, it's, it's really, it starts with, have you been there and done that? So number one, do you know if you're gonna if you're gonna become a managing director or a managing partner, uh, or, or or someone in my shoes? In general, not always. There are non-traditional paths to leadership, and part of my path was that. Uh, but in general, the people that you're coaching and developing are gonna want to know: Did you sit in my chair before? Have you gone through what Have I've gone through? Have you walked in my shoes? Right. Yeah. And on top of it, they're gonna look at your production, they're gonna look at your lifestyle, they're gonna look at the things that you're living out. Are, are, are you walking the walk the same way you're talking the talk? So I think in, in our line of work, it's important that if you're asking someone to do something or you're showing someone how to do something, they need to be able to see it in your example, not just your words. Um, so how do we know when they become a leader? And, and, our, and we, we, I talk about this all the time with our major partner, with Tate. Uh, leadership in the financial service industry, a lot of times, it's not a promotion. It's more responsibility. It's a calling. Yeah. And, and I look at a calling in three ways. Okay. Number one, you have to like it. If you don't like leading people or you don't like having the responsibility of mm -hmm. coaching and developing other people, mm -hmm. and your sole reason for doing it is because you think you're going to get a bigger paycheck. Mm. Or you think it's going to increase your lifestyle? Yeah. Number one, you're going to suck at it. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and number two, you're not going to be fulfilled. It's just going to frustrate you. So number one, you have to like the work. Number two, you have to be good at it. You have to be able to be able to navigate a lot of different things. So you have, you have to like it. You have to be good at it. Uh, and number three, your values have to be in alignment with the organization that you're representing. I put it this way. If you like the work you do, but you're not good at it, it's only a matter of time before you flame out. Mm. If you don't like the work you do, but you're really good at it, then you're never going to be motivated and you're going to become complacent. The alignment. If you like it and you're good at it, but your values aren't aligned, it's only a matter of time before you have a knockdown, drag out fight with your management mm. or senior leadership mm. and you guys go your separate ways. So when I assess whether or not someone's gonna be a leader or when mm -hmm. we look at even the career as, as a whole, we assess it based on those three things. Do they like it? Are they good at it? And are their values in alignment with, with the firms and the people they're gonna be around? If those three things are yes, retention skyrockets. It's fantastic answer, I love that. You can learn to be competent you can learn the ins and outs of big data, spreadsheets and strategies and whatnots, but soft skills are much more difficult. Emotional maturity, the ability to instill trust in those around you, that's something no educational program can give you. And they are critical to what gives a leader that spark, which some have and others lack. If you couple that with the fact that sometimes joining the leadership team isn't a promotion, but a demotion, more hours, more frustrations, more responsibilities. It's no wonder why some companies have such a hard time finding the right people for the job. On that thought, let's flip the script and go into our next segment. We'll talk about staff retention and why all of us are beating ourselves for not buying Zoom stock a couple of years ago. And so from a retention perspective, yeah. this, I mean, last two and a half years of this yeah. world has been crazy. Yeah. And so when you talk about retention and the th the trends that are happening now, like the great resignation, how, <laughs> how, how is Northwestern Mutual thinking about that? Were you impacted by it? If you were, how did, how did you address it? Are, th are there things differently that you did? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, 
So let, let me give you some historical perspective sure. of the industry. So the industry average, so an average financial advisor that comes into a career, any idea what their retention is to the fifth year? What percentage of them are still advisors five years later? Once they started, uh, was, hmm, I'm going to say 50. Eight to 9%. Wow. Wow. The firm that I'm a part of here in Dallas, sure. our retention is about 25% to the fifth year. Okay. So we're three times the industry average. And this goes back to the principle, it starts in the selection process. That's if you select the wrong people, yeah. doesn't matter if they're gonna self-select out. They're out, right? they're out. Yeah. So it starts with selection. And and I, you know, we're really proud of one That's out of four number, advisors yeah. are still with us five years down the road. Cause how many people do you know are with the same company that they were five years ago? Yeah. Very little. Very few, days, yeah, in, very in, few in this day and age. So we're very proud of that retention. I, I don't think it's where we want it to be, but what have we done? It starts in the selection process and it starts with who we select and build and develop to become our leaders. Are our leaders people that new people want to follow? Mm -hmm. The def this purest def definition of leadership is by one of our managing directors. His name is Eddie Caldwell. He says to me all the time, he goes, I think you're a leader. Just turn around and look. Is anyone following you? If nobody's following That's you, powerful. then you're not a leader. That's powerful. And so it goes back to that whole title is not a leadership. And, and so it, in, in our firm, as, as we think about retention and building a culture and building leaders, it, it starts with those principles. That's great. Yeah. That's fantastic. Uh, well, actually, and, and to answer your question on like, what have we done the last couple of years, uh, we've had to get creative. Okay. We, we, we've definitely had to find ways to think differently about our employees, uh, remote work, remote work, flexibility. Um, I, I mean, even in the financial services industry, like here's something over the last 20 years, that has been a huge shift for us. Mm -hmm. Financial services industry was traditionally dominated by men. Mm -hmm. Now as more working moms and women have come into this career, mm -hmm. uh, it's forced us to think differently about what time we may start meetings because uh, there might be kids having to be yeah. dropped off and Daycare, picked up. Um, it, be more flexible on even events that we go out and do. Like every event that we do now is not just a golf outing where traditionally that's what men like to do. Mm -hmm. Now we have to think differently about what can we do that's more inclusive to include all the different types of people in our firm into these types of events. So, I mean, there's a lot of different things that we've had to do and think differently uh, to retain the talent. How, uh, on that same note, we're a technology firm, consulting firm. How has technology played a role in that? Or has it? I mean, well, I'm I mean, sure it has. It just, uh, to what extent? I mean, if I could, if I could go back four years, I'd buy a lot of Zoom stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you and everybody, right? Yeah. Uh, but no, I mean, obviously the, the, the technology has increased the uh, proficiency of our advisors where they traditionally used to have to go drive to meetings yeah. or have their clients come to them. Mm -hmm. uh, now we start a meeting with a button and we end a meeting with a button. And so we're in the world of three or four years ago, we used to be able to see three, maybe four people a day. Mm -hmm. In today's world, you can have eight meetings back to back with clients on Zoom. You can see more people in a given day mm -hmm. by leveraging technology. and. On top of that, the planning process, the technology, the algorithms and the financial planning software that's available, it's, mm -hmm. it's phenomenal what, what, what we can do in today's world, but we've had to embrace it. Uh, and, and, and change is difficult and changing technology platforms and is one thing, but changing the attitudes uh, and dispositions of, of advisors was a whole nother. And, yeah, that, that's been that's been a challenge. Yeah, tech, I mean, it's it, it, uh, the change management process when change happens, getting down to first principle thinking about getting down to the user's level and looking at through their eyes and seeing, hey, how is this impacting you? How can you leverage this better? What can you do with the technology that you have and that could enable you or cripple you? I think it's a big thing to do that change management process. The Industrial Revolution gave us something that up until that explosion, we lacked as a species, leisure time. Before the steam engine and all those nifty toys, we simply existed to survive. Day in, day out. Hobbies weren't hobbies. They were a means to make money. 
You learned to play an instrument, not to unwind, but because you needed it for work. Then, suddenly, we had a lot of time on our hands, and that idea evolved. And we, humanity, see technology as the means to attain just that. Like Pavlov's dogs, we've been trained by tech. Is it any wonder that now, with so much tech and so much innovation, the workforce is demanding more flexibility, more free time, more efficient use of their time? Change is difficult, but we as leaders have to embrace it. And part of that means looking at what the future holds and seeing how to leverage it for the sake of the team. The forecast's next segment will give you the inside scoop on how to help your employees reach that next level. All right, purpose. So the expectations framework was made simply as a guideline, as a framework. It's not a checklist. Um, we understand that everybody here, they're human beings. You're not gonna have exceed in every single category on your, your mid-year or your year-end reviews. That's just not possible. But it is a guideline to set you up for success at Headstorm, and I think even beyond that in your career as, as a, in general. Um, it does empower you to really own your own career development. You can take this expectations framework, the things that you learn from it, and really just grow even beyond that. Um, it's in place to help you to be more than just, hey, I'm a, I'm a software consultant. Hey, I'm you know UX focused, I'm product focused. But to take you to that next level to one day eventually be a successful executive, even me, I mean, this expectations framework, I'm in HR, like, I'm not a technician. Um, what is it, why do I you know, need to abide by this? But I feel like by abiding by this expectations framework, by this guideline that's been set in place, I've been able to take my career up into the next level. So this, these are all things that you, I'm sure you've read, maybe, hopefully, in the employee atlas about what, why the expectations framework was made, but it's really in place to set you up for career success overall. Okay, let's go over these core expectations. Number one, being coachable. Yes, now you can't answer the question for the prize, but <laughs> being coachable. So actively seeking out feedback, um, and then when you have that feedback from your advisor, from your project leader, from your peers, implementing that in your life in a timely manner, timely fashion, um, with a positive attitude, yes. Um, po having a po positive attitude goes into a lot of things. It's how you approach situations. Um, sometimes it's even written communication. How are you coming across when you're online, when you're on Slack? Are you coming off as a negative Nelly? Or are you coming off as a positive person? Um, how you engage with clients, how you engage with your coworkers, that all goes a long way. And then the third core expectations, being reliable, on time prepared for meetings, and all of that other stuff. So being prepared is not a core expectation, but being reliable, that is uh, a core expectation, and preparation is a part of that. So showing up on times for meeting, maybe a minute early if you're hopping on a Zoom call, ooh, getting there early, not two minutes late. So yeah, just being reliable, being on time every single time. So th these are the five pillars of the expectations framework. It's not evangelism, <laughs> it's evangelist, technician, leader, professional, and innovator. Um, so this um, little bit of the expectations framework, um, on the evangelist piece, that's you know being a thought leader. That's exuding culture and everything that you say and do, sometimes that's you know, even outside of Headstorm, you know, we're not preachers or anything like that, but you know you're an evangelist for Headstorm, for technology, for the work that you do at Headstorm. Um, you know, being a technician, sometimes that means that you're a subject matter expert in one area or another. Um, you may save the day with your amazing code or your amazing design work, and my, my thing is amazing emails, right? Because I'm such a technician. <laughs> um, you know, being a leader, improving processes, techniques, inspiring ideas, 
Um, that does not mean that you need to be a project leader or an architect on a project. You can be a leader and you can be an intern or a consultant. Um, being a professional, the way that, you know, maybe you dress to work or show up, that's all in, in a pro professional, right? Um, but how you communicate to clients, um, how you communicate to one another, that all goes into um, being a professional here at Headstorm. Um, and then innovator, that you know, sometimes is coming up with creative uh, ways and solutions to uh, different things and different pieces. Um, you can read this all on our website, actually. That's where I pulled this from. And I was like, oh, this is so nice. Thanks, as always, for tuning in to the forecast brought to you by Headstorm with your host, myself, Julian Placino, and Chris Bryant. As part of this vast community, we hope these tips and insights will make a difference, future-proof your business, your mindset, and help you surpass your expectations. Feel free to reach out. Our contact info is in the description. Hope to see you next time as the forecast brings you more thoughts from industry leaders and strategies to engineer growth.